All right, John Lovett, it is an absolute pleasure to finally have you on the Single Track Podcast. Finn, thank you so much. The screen just uh, showed actual recording is higher quality. So uh, I'm hoping that whatever whatever words come out of my mouth, your <laughs> your programs will run it through their algorithms and make me sm- sound even smarter. Smarter. I got to say, I, I love the reference to, to Boston. Um, I got to say, so we're recording this on a platform called Riverside, which is super inside baseball to the audience. But uh, it's one of the riskier recording platforms I've ever used. But the promise is you get the local audio file on both ends for supreme sound. And uh, that's what I'm banking on. That's all I care about. So here we are. Um, yeah, totally. It's it, uh, the, the local recording is um, a saving grace. The number of times that I've had a guest, like their internet cut out and I couldn't hear what they were saying, but they just kept going. And then the internet came back and you listen to it later and there's no issue because it recorded locally. I was doing an an episode with my coach, David Roche. I think it was, uh, it was either episode 69 or 169. Um, I think it was number 69. Anyway, he talked for like three minutes and I didn't hear a word of it until um afterwards and uh, he was just talking about training theory (laughs) and i didn't have anything to say or add to it and and it was totally fine right um well you know i doubt that there are many listeners in the audience that aren't already familiar with you and we'll get to introductions in a second but i was just thinking about this before we hopped on i'm just generally glad we're doing this in part because one of my goals over the next two, three, four months is to develop more relationships in the podcaster space, to knowledge share as much as possible. Uh, I think really to be colleagues in a sense, because otherwise, in my experience, it can be a lonely craft. And you've been at this a, a lot longer than I have. And so I'm curious if you have any thoughts there. Like, has that kind of camaraderie been something that's gotten you to this point, like three years in as a podcaster? I just love people, period. Uh, the The title of what they do or who they are or how they pay their bills uh, is less relevant to me. I think categorically, though, podcasters need to sort of, I don't want to say band together, but um, <laughs> agree to some things, uh, to say the least. Um, I've had this conversation with Tina Mir and uh, Matt Chittam separately a handful of times where... Um, there are a lot of things that people do well that are um, sort of intuitive. And then there are a lot of things that people do that are intuitive that are somewhat like damaging to the, the platform in general Um, for people that are trying to make it a business or a livelihood. um, I, I, I believe it's important for that goal. Because yeah. people are trying to do this um, for their livelihood, I, I'm not one of them. It's I have a full time job, uh, and I just love the ability to work with brands that that I like, which gives me the ability to say no to brands that I don't like. Um, I still believe there are standards and there are things that people should be doing um, so that it's not you know giving away the farm in exchange for you know a pair of socks. <laughs> As, as we've talked about. That's probably one example, but uh, what are some other things on your list that are damaging to the craft? <laughs> We're just diving straight, straight on <laughs> no, into it. Huh? I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Jonathan. I'm a runner and a blah, blah, blah. Um, what are things that are pe- that people are doing that are dam- that's damaging to the craft? I mean, I, I don't want to like give specific examples because it some of it is... It, um, I don't want to. I don't want to call people out, right? I don't. I don't feel there's any anything to be gained from that. I I see. I'm in a bit of a unique situation where I consider myself a creator, but I'm also on the brand side, and so I know what brands are looking for. I know what's valuable, and I know what works. Uh, and I've been doing this for my entire career, and so it gives me a little more gravity than the average person on the brand side or the average person on um on the podcast side and my dog just saw a squirrel so yep there's the bark (laughs) um yeah we're getting we're getting it yeah go get him alfie (laughs) 
Hey, it's a hard <laughs> life protecting the house. <laughs> I know we must protect this house. Um, this episode sponsored by Under Armour. Um, anyway, <laughs> there's there. So right, so brands brands have a, a specific reason to work with podcasters. Um, they are looking for ways to communicate with their audience. This is a specific marketing objective. They're not just doing it because they like to be friendly. They're doing it because they have performance metrics that they need to hit. And and podcasts are a channel that achieve a business objective. For some brands, it's a very substantial aspect of their business. And for other brands, it's something they're exploring in because everybody else seems to be doing it. Um, so a lot of times there's trade that happens or there's a, a payment aspect of it to enter into a more formal relationship. Now, I've been at brands where there has been no budget and we have to rely on uh, in-kind or product trade that down the road, maybe it leads to a paid relationship. That's great. Uh, for brands that are a premium price point, you can do trades because you know it's not like a ten dollar consumable that you only might consume once <laughs> i i see that happening all the time it's like um a, a product that you know you, you might buy twice a year asking for like three instagram posts and and you know whatnot and some people would charge a thousand dollars for that and others would would give it away for free and so Without going too far or shooting myself in the foot too much, uh, I just believe that there should be some baseline level of integrity or um, v value exchange limitations or agreement that um, should exist. But this is never going to happen, right? Because <clears throat> everyone is always looking to get noticed or yeah. be the next partner or have that breakthrough performance or have that guest that, you know, skyrockets them to the top of the charts and then um, blah, 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 blah. So people are always hungry. And in a, in an arena where people are always hungry, they're always going to devalue themselves in exchange for opportunity. I think this is kind of like where you were getting to with the launch of the podcast in general, because you were just frustrated with this, like, concept for pro athletes yeah and i'm frustrated with this concept for pro athletes who are but who are not getting too for podcasters too um but the both of us are friends with enough pro athletes to know that this this is not a problem that's unique to pro athletes it's yeah. creators pro athletes podcasts anyone with an audience that there's no like set media buy like if you're selling digital media through wall street journal or New York Times or whatever, like there's a formula. And if you fall outside the formula, it's called CPM, cost per thousand. And if you fall outside that formula, the answer is no. <laughs> that doesn't happen in in this type of creator relationship. And it's so fascinating because I understand it from both sides, from the brands with no money, the athletes with no money, the brands with money, and the athletes with money. It it all makes sense. And it's about the opportunities afforded to people and who can say yes to what and who can say no to what. I can say no to anyone I want because I don't rely on podcasts to pay the bills. And I, I will eat dinner if I say no to a brand that you you say yes to. You, you might have be in the same situation, but I have a full-time job and the reason I work with brand partners is because I find it fun and I like helping people achieve their goals. Brands have goals. My friends at brands have goals. And, um, I had one other point on that, that I, um, it, I just like sharing good stuff with, with people. And, uh, I like to have the honesty and integrity <coughs> to say no to things that I don't feel fit me or fit my audience or allow me to feel good about promoting something where I know that people work hard for their money and I don't want to tell them to buy things just because like it enables me to put effort into the podcast and 
for me, it's a, it's more of a, a metric of how do I allocate my time versus my resource or my, my dollars. I got to say one thing before we give you a proper introduction. One of the things that I appreciate about you is, uh, like you said, you're not hungry. You can say no because you have this position outside the podcasting space that that, that gives you that power. Um, it makes me super nervous because I think by the time this episode goes live at the end of end of September, early October, uh, I think I'll officially be full time on single track. And one oh, of yeah. the Hell yeah. Yes. I'm super stoked by, by all means, super stoked. But, um, I am very concerned about where my mind goes and how strong I stay. I stick to my morals and my ethics when it comes to backing products I believe in that are going to ultimately be supporting the show and all these other media efforts. Um, I like to think that I'm going to stand strong and I'm not going to have to make any sacrifices, but what a, what a dilemma, you know, and, and you really, uh, don't know how you are going to respond until you're in it. Um, so yeah, I, I think totally. everything said there is fascinating. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, and I've talked with a lot of people who do podcasts full time or they are creators full time and you sort of have to have this dialogue that internally, like, man, those shoes really suck for me, but <laughs> they're going to pay me a thousand bucks for this post or, um, they're offering a three month partnership and, it's so interesting and fascinating to see that intersection of comfort versus integrity versus yeah, your moral compass. Like um, th there have been brands that have come on to the podcast space. Very strong. Uh, AG one being one of them. I like their product. I just can't use it. Um, it has B12 that's, that's too high and I get, a, I got a skin rash. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I also, I know they're a sponsor of your podcast and they're a sponsor of a lot of podcasts and I really respect them investing two and a half million dollars a year on the podcast medium. Um, but I, I had to say no to them because I wasn't comfortable saying this is something I use and this is something you should use too. And it's not, to me, it's not, it's, this isn't bad mouthing them. It's not, um, it's not saying that, that, that your listeners shouldn't use them. I'm saying it didn't work for me. I can't stand behind it, but there are plenty of other people who love it and promote it and it works well for them. Uh, and there's a ton of science. And so it's a, it's a dilemma of, you know, what, what truly does work for you and what, what do you want to share with your audience? But if they came back and offered me five times what they offered me initially, I'd figure out a way to <laughs> weave it into my life. No, I'm serious. Like yeah. I would go through the mental gymnastics of, okay, how could I, <laughs> how could I use this? Well, I would use it while <laughs> traveling or I would use it while on the road or, or like come up with something where it, first of all, it must fit into my life. And then we can talk kind of a thing. But again, like where's the, where's that threshold where like the, the seesaw tips in the favor of saying yes, I don't know where it is because everyone can be bought. Everyone has a price. And, and where, where is that line? Most people will never find it. I don't know why you just made me think of this, but in the same way we just successfully mapped the human genome and we can track everything there. It'd be kind of fun to think about like when athletic greens came into the podcasting space, what was the first show that they reached? And then how did the uh, influence <laughs> grow from there? And like, how does that whole sponsorship map out into our space? Like if somebody could just do that, I think that'd be an absolutely fascinating uh, data visualization to show for. Yeah. Well, the, the web, the <laughs> web of, of outreach would be fascinating and they have a, an audio partnerships manager who is the, um, I find this so fascinating. They have so many partnerships that they have an audio and a video. I'm, I'm sort of assuming there, if they have an audio, they have a video, but like, it's the same thing with, with what we've done at Inside Tracker, right? We sponsor 50 plus podcasts and that's not to say one is better than the other. It's to say, no, this is a real medium from yeah. a, from a marketing standpoint. 
And when I go to races now, people stop me if I'm wearing the inside tracker shirt and they're like, Hey man, like, thanks for supporting blah, blah, blah podcast. Like I love listening to them. And to me, what I'm hearing is thank you for enabling somebody to do something that I enjoy. And that's a win, right? The, I'll, I'll sponsor a hundred podcasts, 200 podcasts, um, in, in that scenario. And I like how hopefully our, I have ADHD. If you can't, if you haven't picked up on this and hopefully our listeners are able to follow the jumping from oh, brand I all side the time. to fine. personal side to blah, blah, blah. But, um, anyway, the, the fact that they spent two and a half million dollars on podcasts is, is a good thing, right? It means that, and I'm, we're going to get into, um, endemic versus non-endemic sponsors i'm sure um but definitely investing that much money into a into a medium or a channel is is a sign that it, that that's no longer an experiment <laughs> an experiment is fifty thousand dollars yeah so well, let's let's bookmark this uh because i've been a terrible host and i have totally <laughs> neglected introducing you so you are john levitt and let's dive in with how you got involved at Inside Tracker, which has over the last eight to 10 years become, without a doubt, a household name in our sport. So take it from there. How'd you get involved? Sure. So uh, I study sport management. And first, thank you for having me on the podcast. Uh, I've loved seeing what you've been doing and the fact you've put out 100 episodes in this short period of time. Um, 98% of podcasts don't make it past the first three episodes. And 57% of uh, statistics are made up. On the <laughs> yeah. Um, so I went to school uh, for sport management and marketing. I interned with the Bruins. Um, that's hockey for all of us runners. Um, the Bruins won the Stanley Cup that year, which was awesome. Um, it's the only year I've ever interned for the Bruins. So I, correlation is causation. I don't know. Um, but anyway, I decided I didn't want to work for a brand. Uh, I got started working at, um, I had an internship that was at a company that was selling spirulin and chlorella algae, uh, positioned two endurance athletes. We were about 10 years too early. <laughs> it's huge as a, as a, um, as an industry, it's huge now, uh, which is cool to see. It's like, oh yeah, I knew about that stuff, uh, 15 years ago or 10 years ago. Anyway. I met Inside Tracker at an event in November or October of 2014. Wasn't looking for a job at the time. And the event was called Executive Athletes, put on by Ken Lubin, who hosts his own podcast called Executive Athletes. Um, I was the youngest person in the room by probably 15 years. My dad invited me. He said it was the best $10 he'd ever spent. Um, and I spent, they, they did a little uh, presentation and then, um, after that, I was basically interviewed by the CEO and founder. I didn't really know I was being interviewed and all but got a job offer right there. Uh, two weeks later, I signed an offer um, and that was November of 2014. Uh, it's been a fascinating growth since then. We had eight, about eight people when I joined. I now lead welcome to Inside Tracker meetings for more than eight people at a time. Uh, we have like 140 employees now. So it's been fascinating to watch the growth of uh, truly a pre-revenue startup to a company um, of, we just closed $50 million last week um, in Series B financing, which is awesome and gives us you know some good runway uh, and ability to, to do cool stuff um, with the team we have and with the team we will have. Um, so I've, I've seen the space go from yeah, social media is interesting. Oh, podcast. That's kind of a cool thing to think about. Um, to no, this is like, this is real. <laughs> this is a real business. There are a lot of people here and, um, social media is a must for everyone at this point, uh, in the pro athlete space, which I think we should also talk about. Um, I know it's on your list. <laughs> And, um, and the podcast medium has exploded as, uh, as a, as a gateway to conversation. Um, a much shorter answer to that question is I love helping people 
And Insight Tracker is my platform to be able to do that where I also get healthcare. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a, a salary uh, kind of a deal. Can you talk about your general interests in social media and the podcasting space and like why you were so interested in, in carving out your own niche there. And I know I'm asking you a lot of questions here, but like also we, we talked offline and your boss was incredibly supportive about this early, totally. early days at inside tracker. So I guess take it wherever you want, but um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I've always found the Northern Arizona elite process of sharing the story to be interesting. Basically like train hard, take chances, share the whole process. That's sort of an abridged um, version of it. And there's so much, um, so much of social media is like a highlight reel and it always has been. And I really enjoy the people who don't just share success stories, but share the like, I'm in the shit right now and I'm, I'm going through it, which isn't to like, some people call that like, I don't know, there's some, term for it that involves the word porn i forget what the word is but like struggle struggle uh, porn struggle porn yeah I, yeah i think that's very overplayed and there's plenty of it that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about like being a real human and showing it on social media my my summer of running this year sucked and i didn't hide it and i wasn't like oh look at me i live in boulder this is beautiful i'm like i can't get any motivation to go out on these beautiful trails um so that's me that's that's who that's who I've been. And when I, what I do, what I, what I've done for inside tracker over the years is basically like meet athletes and work with athletes and also talk to individuals who are interested in, in using the program. And I think it's important to mention that it's not, it's not just for athletes. It wasn't started to help athletes. It was started to help all humans live a better and more full life through a personalized approach to nutrition. And it was, it evolved from nine year old founder. He wasn't nine when he founded the company, but <laughs> the idea occurred to him when he was nine. He's like, people die. I don't want to die. I want to live forever. And fast forward 30 plus years and he's a scientist and that's his life goal. Anyway, um, my role has always involved meeting athletes and running with them, eating with them, et cetera. And I'm a pretty curious person. And so on a, on a run with Zach Miller in May of 2018, we were at the Manitou Incline um, and I did one lap and Zach did his and then came back and ran the rest of mine with me. Then we ran down the bar trail and got Mexican food. And Zach put on a clinic when it, of eating and ate more in one sitting than I'd seen anyone eat, period. <laughs> but he was running like 150 to 170 miles at the time. And I was like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? I love asking why. And he put his fork down and talked for 10 minutes. And so the reason I say he was putting on an eating clinic is because he didn't eat for then 10 minutes while he was talking. Anyway, I was like, I'm sitting on gold here. This is fascinating. Like, I, I must share this information. Fast forward a few months, I'm listening to Billy Yang and Mario Frioli talk about the like um, birth of podcasting as a medium. And there are so many people who have a podcast now. This is December of 2018. And the line was, iron sharpens iron. Um, we're all better for it, right? you having these great conversations with all these people in the industry uh, and, and athletes and whatnot, like that makes everyone want to be better because it's not a competition. It's a rising tide lifts all ships. Let's all be better because we can all be better. And maybe it's a little competition. I don't know. Um, I love it anyway. So January of 2019, I'm like, I'm going to start a podcast and I put out some, tweets about this podcast. I go to Flagstaff and I record with um, a couple of people. Uh, I had recorded one episode with a friend, Sarah Duffy, that was released as episode three. Um, and 
I'm meeting with Ben Rosario to talk about NAS Elite. And we were talking at a hotel in Flagstaff. I was going to a trail camp there. And he was like, yeah, man, we just like, the team is all about sharing the story and we just have to be prepared to do articles and interviews and podcasts. And I was like, podcasts, <laughs> that's my end. So I was like, I got some sticks in the, in my bag here. Want to, want to chat over in that corner? He's like, man, are you serious right now? I was like, yeah. It's like, okay, cool. I didn't want to do anything else this afternoon. So let me make a few calls and we'll do it. And so that was the first like pro recording I did and the first episode I ever released. The second one was with Ali Kiefer in that same recorded in that same hotel. Um, and again, that was, that was almost a million downloads ago, which is so crazy. Um, and so anyway, that's huge. Thank you. Sometime in, in mid October, I believe. Um, so our C I was reporting to our CEO at the time and I was a little nervous cause I just like did it and I didn't tell anyone. And I was like, this is, I'm just going to do this. And I didn't really know how it would be received, but we have such a, such a strong culture internally of like, everyone is passionate about a lot of things and it's not all work all the time. Like our CEO volunteers X number of hours a week and nobody really knows that he does that. Nobody needs to know that he does that, but every Wednesday he's handing out food at his, at his temple and he's packaging meals. Um, and so like everyone has different things that they do with their life. It's not just about work. So anyway, I start doing this podcast. I put out a few episodes and, um, at the time he, we, we lived in the same neighborhood. So he was driving me home and we'd have like, the best 30 minutes or most productive 30 minutes of my day was like this mentorship that was happening in the car ride home. Anyway, one day he's like, so you started a podcast, huh? I was like, Oh God, here it is. And, um, we talked about it. He's like, great. The, the stronger your brand grows, the better it is for the company and vice versa, by the way. Um, so do everything that you need to do to elevate your own brand. And so I took that as like the strongest form of enablement to pursue passions in and outside of work, which makes me want to do more in both arenas, right? The better I am personally, the better it is professionally. The better I am professionally, the better it is personally. And it's such a powerful place to be in. And it's, I, I acknowledge that it's so unique and such a privilege. And if I don't make something of that extreme privilege, that's an incredible waste of an opportunity. So that's basically how I've seen this whole podcast thing, uh, which has turned into 230 episodes and 960,000 downloads. And like, I employ four people. <laughs> it's crazy. That and, is, that's the most interesting part to me. That's super cool. <laughs> You're creating jobs. I'm creating jobs. And, and so one of them, like, she's like, I want to downsize my other clients and do more with you. And the brands paying me enables that to happen. Um, because I couldn't, I couldn't afford her otherwise. Um, I mean, she's making like a decent, a decent wage <laughs> from what I'm paying her. It's not enough to live on for sure, but she has other clients. Um, but it, it's the kind of thing that like, as I scale the podcast, she does more work and I pay her more and I don't do anything more. And so for someone who has, uh, and, and her name is Emily Hall and she's incredible. <coughs> if you're thinking of launching a podcast, talk to Emily. Um, or if you have a podcast, talk to Emily. Anyway, um, it's, it's pretty scalable because she has somebody under her. <laughs> And so as, as her relationships with her clients have grown, she employs more people so that she can do what she's good at. So I said about a year into it, I was like, I want to get to a place where I'm just having conversations. And now I'm at a place where I'm having conversations and uploading them. And that's basically it. Um, and it's incredible because I still have a full-time job. And I'm doing less than I ever was with the podcast. And it's providing like 
monthly pay that's predictable for four people, right? One of them is a collegiate athlete, Ruby Wiles. And it's like, it's how she, she works with a couple of podcasts, but like, it's how she puts food on her table. And it's so cool to be able to do that. And so moving it back to the brand partnership stuff, like it's, this is why it's important to work with brands that you love and then share them with other people because none of this would be possible without the brands. I wouldn't have the time or the monetary resources to focus on this with this many people at this level if like the Tracksmith relationship hadn't been going on for 18 months and they hadn't seen a X time multiple on their investment um, month after month after month after month for 18 months they're paying these people effectively to put out the conversations that I'm having that tons of people <laughs> seem to be enjoying. Um, so it's this fun ecosystem where like every person has a, a role, whether you're the person listening to it, you don't even ever have to buy anything from, from the people that, that you're consuming content from, right? Mm -hmm. If you rate and review and subscribe and share that's gold. Podcasts grow because of that. If you look at the Swap podcast, the number of people that have, first of all, with David and Megan Roche, their podcast is fantastic. And they have a, a super strong audience that is listening to every episode and they are rating and reviewing and subscribing and doing all these things that make it boost higher and higher and higher on iTunes or Apple's list. And that's why it's grown so much because it takes incredible content, inspiring hosts and an audience that believes in the, 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 the creators in the, the message. creators. And they have that perfect trio in like, in a way that almost nobody else does. Um, which is so cool to see. I got to say two things. Number one, I got, I think I've said this on a previous episode before, but David and Megan, obviously like two of the great geniuses in our sport and somehow they're able to deliver on both, uh, quality. Like they, they, the, 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 the quality in all of the content that they put out is incredible. And the quantity is also amazing. Like I feel like every single day I'm getting a new Patreon message from David and Megan about like, you know, this like 2000 word blog post that they put out on training theory. And I'm just like, I, you just kind of have to bow down and just be like, you guys are on another level that I'll never be able to match. And uh, I'm just glad you're invested in our world. Totally. And it's so interesting. Um, when they found out they were having a baby, they were like, hmm, we might have to change the way we work <laughs> because <laughs> coaching is not infinitely scalable, but a Patreon and a podcast in theory is. Yeah. And so newsletter, uh, this kind of stuff, like they can manage a sustainable income without, you know, I, I stayed at their house in 2019 for 10 days. Um, and they're on from 5am till 8pm. The, their routine was wake up, work, eat, run, work, eat, run, Work, go to sleep, watch some Infinite TV. game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's, that, that's like, you can't do that if you have a, a newborn. And so they realized that. And they're like, we need to figure out a different model so that we can actually like continue to buy Addie all of the toys and stuff that she desires. <laughs> it reminds um, me, it reminds me, I got to interject. There's this great quote that I actually just put in the newsletter yesterday uh and i'm gonna read it off it's a quote it's a beautiful day to start working on something that keeps working after you stop working totally yes and i think that that just fits what they do or what they're transitioning to perfectly yeah passive income is wealth passive income is is um is the goal and i think that all of us should aspire to be rich with our time and have as much free time or as much time to spend with our friends and family as possible. And so it's sort of everything I do is in the pursuit of 
financial freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a way to do it. I got to tell you one story that's just coming to mind because I think, you know, you talked about how you were already having all of these off the record conversations with fascinating industry people, and it was just time to bring them on the record. Uh, there's this story about this BBQ down in the great state of Texas, and it always had these massive lines out the door. And those potential customers were getting frustrated because it was taking a long time to get seated. And the, the head cook at the restaurant had all these pieces of the meat. They're now called burnt ends. And he's like, I have an idea. Let's take this tray of burnt ends and let's bring them out to the people in the line waiting outside the door and we'll feed them those burnt ends while they're waiting for a seat. Lo and behold, it became the most popular thing on the menu. So that a, but B they just recycled something that they were going to throw away or not deliver value on and bring it to these customers. And I feel like that's what you've done with the podcast. Burnt ends are like $25 a pound and they're delicious. Right. And so these are, this is, this is burnt ends, but for conversations in the running industry. Totally. Yeah. I love that. I I just need to rename the podcast burnt. (laughs) Um, Okay. One, one more question before we kind of start talking about like state of podcast, state of sponsorship, stuff like that. Um, when you think about putting a podcast together and you think about the guests that you want to have on and the way that you want to structure conversations, generally speaking, like what's your method? What's your style? <laughs> I don't have one, honestly, it's embarrassing. Um, but I think that's like, I've never had an agenda. I truly just want to have conversations with people who are who society might deem as conventionally successful and understand why they're successful and what we can learn from them. And so the framework of all of my podcast episodes, I'd say after episode 55 or 60, maybe 40, um, is with, with that framework, right? Who are you? What makes you really excited? And what can these several thousand people or what can one person learn from you? And so often people ask, like, oh, what are we going to talk about? And my answer is, well, I'll ask you who you are and uh, we'll talk about success, growth, failure, uh, and and what makes you happy. You could get someone to talk for 10 hours about that kind of stuff right. because it, it doesn't really matter the details. It's how you deliver it and how, like what are the takeaways? So. In terms of guest curation, I'm not great at this either. I just sort of talk to whoever I'm interested in or who has um, reached out recently. Um, I've I I was on like a streak of saying yes to literally everyone who asked to be on the podcast, and um, th- it's good and bad, right? You get I've I've had a lot of feedback that people want to hear more like mid to back of the pack conversations, mm. which is great. And I also think that there's a little bit of um, earned, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to, I know what I'm trying to say. I don't know how to say it. Like implicit knowledge from an Olympian, right? But what I've learned is that's not always true. There's some really boring, conventionally successful people. I haven't talked to a lot of them, but um, I've talked to enough of them to know that they exist, but what I find so interesting, I reference Gwen Jorgensen all the time. I've become pretty good friends with her. She's an Olympic gold medalist and she won something that she had aspired to win for her entire life. I don't really care about her winning Olympic gold in Rio in 2016. I care about what did she do the next day? and the next day, and the next day, and today, and tomorrow, and the next day. Because that's the human experience that people can learn from. Very few people are ever going to be at the, like, you're so rarely going to be at your own personal best, let alone like a world best. So I don't think it's useful to aspire to be like that. I think it's useful to, or sorry, it is useful to learn what people do along the journey of becoming excellent. Well, 230 episodes in spoiler alert, the, um, <laughs> the, the takeaway is just be consistent. Yeah, that's it. 
uh, be consistent, have community around you and, uh, and, and draw or, or, or establish a version of success that's entirely within your control and you win, right? That's pretty much the secret. If I asked, I asked what does success mean to you to enough people who have answered in a subjective manner to basically categorically say the people who create their own definition of success that is entirely subjective are the ones that are conventionally the most uh, successful and they're usually the happiest. And most (laughs) importantly, when things aren't going well, they pull on gratitude and joy and love of the process. And so I'm grateful for my shitty summer because it forced me to like live that. And I got through that from 200 conversations I've had with excellent people, conversations with David, conversations with friends and family around, but, but mostly the podcast and what I've learned from the podcast. Um, and gratitude is a, is a huge aspect of, your ability to be successful and navigate um, tough moments. People listening are probably like, oh yeah, but like, how can you be happy all the time? Or how can you be grateful all the time? It's like, mm, it's not really it. It's in the weeds. Sometimes you just sit in the suck and it, it can't be joyful all the time unless you're on drugs, right? Like you cannot alter your biochemistry to be happy all the time. It's not possible. And and so many people on social media are like, happy all the time. Yes, they're lying. <laughs> you can be like really joyful a lot of the time, but I don't believe that. Anyway, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but that, that's that's been my takeaway, which isn't what you asked. <laughs> but well, well, that's the, what you get. But you said a lot of interesting stuff there. And, and one thing I want to zero in on is, um, you know, as you've produced... 200 plus episodes over the last three, four years, and you've built up a pretty massive audience. You're starting to probably get a lot more suggestions and recommendations about the type of content that you should be outputting. And uh, there's this, I used to work in politics and there's this famous concept of like, for elected, elected officials, you're either a delegate or a trustee. And the delegate is the person who always has their constituents like in their ear and they're just taking orders versus the trustee who has been voted in and like, they can just do as they wish and <laughs> the audience will just kind of like trust that they're going to go in the right direction. Do you feel like um, y- you can just like trust your intuition, trust your gut about what's going to be good and you're going to produce those episodes? Or do you feel like um, there is some pressure to give in to your audience from time to time? It's, I feel like I'm more on the side of the trustee where I am just going to trust my gut, right? Like I don't need this. And it, yeah, that's so free. That. And I can do whatever I want when, when the social justice movement of June, 2020 kicked off in earnest, I said, whatever the hell I wanted to say and felt great about that. I didn't care who I pissed off or, um, or rubbed the wrong way because my own personal integrity and making people feel like they belong or helping people to feel like they belong and exposing my audience to a diverse group of guests so that black, white, Indian, Chinese, uh, Japanese, anyone, um, pair, uh, different body sizes, different abilities of amputee runners, anyone like, I don't really care if it hurts my numbers. If it's not like a conventionally successful or attractive or whatever guest, I'm more interested in, in curating real people. And, um, I did get a lot of feedback on that. Mostly favorable. I do also want to talk about being a male podcaster versus being a female podcaster or just being a male Let's do it. in this space in general, because, um, I don't know if you read Zoe Rome's, uh, I did. piece for Re- Relay this morning where she yeah. talked about her relationship with social media and her body and um, being an athlete and using her body for, you know, posting bikini shots and whatnot. I think, I think the world is a very challenging place for um, women. Yes. <laughs> and I can't even imagine 
the the difficulty of being so public. Um, I'm good friends with Amelia Boone, and she tells me all the time about like she has a hundred thousand followers, and she gets so much like weird feedback on her experiences and whatnot. And um, I barely get anything. I barely get like the, the worst I get is I come here for nutrition talk and you tell me that non-binary people deserve a place in the world. Yeah. <laughs> like, of course they yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> what are you kidding me? What, this is insane. Um, but that's like, that's as far as it goes. It's not a personal attack on me or my body or anything like that, which again, it, we're in this position of privilege. We must use it. Yep. And we must use it to highlight others so that others feel like they belong. And to me, that's what it comes down to. Like there, there's no point to having an audience if you can't help with it. The last conversation I ever had with my grandfather, I think we talked about this. I mentioned it on a bunch of podcasts, my own and others at this point, but he basically said that the whole point of life is to leave the world a better place than when you entered it. So every single time I have this conversation or every single time I am able to do something that helps one person, like to me, that feels like living life. And that's the point of living life. Um, everyone just wants to feel like they belong. And uh, when I had a conversation with Raj Paul Panu, an Indian American uh, ultra runner who focuses on road, ultras crazy um anyway he said i'm often the only brown person on the starting line and i want to do well so that other people can see me other indians or or uh, american indians uh, um, indian americans um can see that they can do this too yeah. and that's that's the feedback that i want to hear i don't really care about the the criticism don't take don't take criticism from someone you wouldn't take advice from is basically how I live my life on the, on the internet. If, if you're not going to listen to someone's guidance and they haven't built up enough respect from you for that, don't listen to their criticism. Let's talk about the state of running podcasts. Like there's a lot of things that I think about on a daily basis and we've seen it hashed out on Twitter people are concerned about like our podcast too saturated. Is there too much repetitiveness in, in the running podcast world? So do you share any of those concerns before we talk about optimism? Do you share any of those concerns about like the direction that our particular world of podcasts is headed in? No. <laughs> you want me to say more, please? Um, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, there are so many ears to listen to these episodes and um, it's not something I concern myself with. Um, if someone wants to create a podcast and carve out a niche, great, go for it. I don't think, I don't think it's eating up um, the bandwidth of, of others. What, what it may be doing is eating bandwidth of sponsors, which is why I'm so invested um, pun intended in, non-endemic sponsors and I'm so interested in well who else can we bring into the space versus and make it a bigger pond to swim in versus like carving out lanes in the pond and making swim lanes I think the the growth of the number of podcasts is kind of funny right like the joke is like oh everybody has a podcast now but it's basically true between being a podcast, having a podcast and a newsletter. Um, but it's, if you think about it, like it's just because people are passionate about things and that's a good thing. And it's good. It's a good thing that people are so passionate about things that unite them. I know so many coaches who have a podcast as a way to disseminate information to their, to their, li to their athletes Andrew Simmons, lifelong athlete or defining endurance, um, based in Golden, Colorado. He's got a couple hundred people to listen to his episodes. And he told me that he has so many athletes he works with that he doesn't have time to like explain 
energy metabolism for the umpteenth time, but refer back to episode 16 or whatever it is. And you can hear him talking to his athletes about a specific topic. That's great. There are plenty of coaches that, that are doing this and they have 25 listeners and it's like there are 17 athletes and somebody's parents <laughs> who cares. There are going to be a bunch of, of larger ones that sort of drift to the top. And that's how natural selection works. It's like, um, if it's if it if it's intended to grow and you put effort into growing it and the content is good and you're invested in making it successful or whatever you define success as um, and you f- understand algorithms, <laughs> then it will grow. Like I need to be on YouTube. I think like investing time you and do. resources into into YouTube, which is the single the second largest search engine in the world. Um, you may have told me that. Um, <laughs> that's that's a way to like actually grow. And so the 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 more enthusiast or, or hobby podcasters aren't going to be investing their time and effort into putting up a YouTube that like three people will see. But somebody who already has four or five thousand listens per episode is recording video or doing live episodes in person, where you can just like set up a camera. Why would you not be on YouTube if you're intending to grow? Again, I'm not doing it currently, but um, I can just turn the dial up with with Emily and send her, send her more content, and boom! All of a sudden, we're on YouTube. I I couldn't agree more. I want everyone to start a podcast. I want everyone to start a YouTube. Uh, I, I read this somewhere, or maybe I heard it somewhere a lot of people deal with writer's block. So I can totally see why writing out these Instagram descriptions and blog posts and all that kind of stuff can be intimidating and daunting. Far less people have talker's block. And I think as soon as you get a microphone in in front of somebody and you're prompted with certain things to think about, uh, a lot of interesting stuff by and large tends to, tends to come out. And uh, I want to see just more athletes do it. I think that, um, Maybe it might have been Mike Cafusi who you had on the show a couple of weeks back. Like he reposted something on Twitter, like, "Hey runners, are you are you concerned or intimidated about making content?" There's this one Japanese runner that just has a photo of him running in silence for 20 minutes. Like, don't overthink it. it has a hundred thousand. It has like a hundred thousand views. Yeah, yeah, it's so <laughs> fascinating. I, I want to, like you said, I want to see more athletes doing it. Grayson Murphy and I were talking about this. I know you're you're friends with her as well, and she straddles the line between like influencer, I hate that word and creator and, and athlete. And, um, she's someone who even as an athlete has taken a lot of criticism because she straddles road and trail or track and trail. Like how dare she? No, it's freaking awesome. Um, and her ability to just say, I'm going to do what makes me happy. We did an episode in December of 2019 I titled it, follow your arrow. Um, like the song, uh, follow your arrow, wherever it points. I love that. I love country music. And that was a very appropriate mm-hmm. one for that one. Anyway, um, she's so good at storytelling and talk about a way to add value to a relationship with a brand. We work with her at Inside Tracker and we have for two years, two plus years, um, formally and informally prior to that. And her ability to connect with her audience allows us to pay her because she's driving like actual interest and conversion on our end. And so here's this feedback loop of, well, we have a creator relationship with her where it's not predicated on race results, um, which I love. And maybe one day we'll do bonuses or whatever, but uh, we can talk about that too. Um, But it's focused on, okay, here are X deliverables and, you can predict this for the next six to nine to 12 months. And if you go get pregnant, totally fine. Actually great. Now you're more relatable. Um, This kind of a thing where um, it allows for the connection. And the more that people can connect, everyone's craving connection. COVID taught us this. Everyone wants to be connected to people and uh, everybody is so hyper connected 
but we're less connected than ever before because everybody's so hyper connected that you're never paying attention to it. And when I first started podcasting, I did every single episode in person, face to face, two feet away, three feet away, whatever. Our phones were on airplane mode for an hour. All you could do was talk to the person in front of you. When was the last time you did that in real life? Oh, man. <laughs> Months. Months, at least. It, yeah, exactly. And so people crave it, and I was craving it, um, which is one of the reasons I started a podcast. And it's one of the reasons why when the pandemic started, <laughs> I started putting out two a week because I was having so many conversations while stuck in my fourth floor apartment that I needed those conversations quite literally to like keep my yep. sanity and stay yep. alive. Um, and so the ability to even these people that do the like, they just do it themselves and they just talk for 45 minutes um, or they have a, a, a co-host and the co-host and the host talk for an hour or whatever, like you're letting people in to your life and telling these stories that make you so human. I can't tell you the number of people that have like reached out and they're like, I feel like I know your whole life story <laughs> and you're the host. Yeah. You're not even the one being asked the questions. <laughs> um, and so I've, you talk about format of the episode. Um, I get <laughs> the funniest feedback I get or criticism I get on the podcast. Every so often I look at the reviews and uh, if you're of the type who likes to, review please go review finn's podcast because it's awesome and helps it grow um but finish this episode first um the feed the feedback is references the same stories or like this thing with my grandfather or running rim to rim to rim or my pr marathon in 2019 and i use these stories of these like epic things that i do to connect with the guest and i often forget that like the same person has listened to all 200 plus episodes <laughs> and the guest might not be a listener. And so it's like this balance of like, I just have to do epic things all the time to be relatable to my guests with like, okay, pick a different takeaway from, you know, the 17th time you've told the picky bars story at the grand Canyon. I got to say that actually, and I don't know, well, you've inspired me to think about this, but I've had similar criticisms. A lot of people probably rightfully uh, criticize me for a lot of verbal tics that I have in shows. And I think everything is fascinating, which is true. I really do. <laughs> but I, I do think that when you are on the hook in public to create content and have conversations and to recruit guests, it does inspire you to try to do more quote unquote, interesting things in, in real life. Like I, totally. there are things I'm motivated to do from like a running standpoint or uh, to go see a certain movie or to watch a TV show or to read a book just to like broaden my experience. And, yeah. and I, I, so I, I kind of like the forcing function there. Yeah. I love it. Um, but anyways, this is a little bit of a different direction, but you mentioned that the term non endemic when we were talking about sponsorships earlier. And um, I, I, this is kind of where I want to take the conversation here. Uh, we were talking offline maybe one or two weeks ago about how we think that this, the entrance of quote unquote non endemic sponsors into the sport could be one of the next great growth opportunities for athletes, podcasters, creators, et cetera. Uh, why are you maybe talk about why you're so bullish about this? And um, w when you think about it, how you compare it to the status quo. <clears throat> so I'm personally uh, fascinated by the sales process and I really like the chase. <laughs> and this is why I enjoy pursuing sponsorship, but not executing on sponsorship, which is why I've hired a team to execute on sponsorship. So it's been, it's become, I don't want to say easy because that's like a, whatever it's been accessible to, to get sponsors that have running shoes or running apparel or shirts or whatever. Um, and as someone who doesn't do this full time and doesn't depend on it, sometimes I have a little guilt around um, having their dollars flow to me. So I like to be creative and I like to think outside the box. Who else can I work with? Who else can I bring into the space? And I really like being the first and then able to connect and like be the proof of concept. 
So long story short, I got my solar company to sponsor the podcast and I've now paid off my solar thanks to nine months or 10 months of uh, sponsorship from them plus the um, federal tax credit, which is 30%, which is insane. So our initial conversation was, hey, you guys have a product that is good for the earth, saves money, and helps people who like to be outdoors, helps preserve the outdoors for people who like to be outdoors. So who should, who is in theory, the perfect candidate to buy solar? <laughs> a trail runner. Um, so long story short, they agreed. And um, now we're, we're telling that story because I was so frustrated that the process of buying solar was so simple and so like economically viable for anyone with a roof that um, is suitable. So much so that like I could have chosen financing and started saving $40 a month every month from day one through year 25. And then after that, it's totally free. Or I could buy it, get the 30, at the time it was 26% federal credit, buy it, um, save a bunch of money from paying. Um, and then it adds some multiplier on the value of your home without being an additional long story short. I saw an opportunity to take advantage of being the first to explain something to a community where I thought it would relate to. Yeah. Well, it's worked and a half dozen people have signed up for solar, which was so successful for them that, right. Cause it's a very considered pr purchase where the average purchase is $27,000. So six people buying a pair of shoes is totally insignificant, but six people buying a $30,000 system is pretty substantial. And so it was so successful that they had, they basically added more resources on their side to manage this relationship and they want to do more with it. And so I said, look, I'm not unique. I'm just talking to the right people in the right way that I think that, that I should communicate with them out of frustration that nobody has done this yet. This is going to work. And then I'm going to introduce you to a bunch of my friends and publishers and creators, and you're going to connect with them. And then trail running will be 10% of your business next year, which is $10 million, which is like not out of the realm of possibility when we've already done 200 K from it. So I see, I see something like that. And the company is freedom solar. Their their yeah. CEO. And I did a, um, <clears throat> a podcast, uh, on which was released on earth day. Um, he's a, he's a mountain biker. He did Leadville 100 this year. Fascinating guy, absolutely focused on, um, alcohol recovery, alcohol, being in recovery from alcoholism and everything else that comes before everything else, even before family, even before, cause if he doesn't have his sobriety, he doesn't have anything else. And so I found it so fascinating that here's a guy who, who was so vulnerable about, his human experience. And he's also the CEO of a hundred million dollar company who's doing great things in the world. Mm -hmm. And they were willing to take a chance on some guy that showed up at their office, um, the weekend of a bachelor party. <laughs> and, uh, here we are bringing solar to, to the masses. But what I find this to be excited, why I find this to be exciting is because their investment into me, which was a success, will hopefully lead to investment into others, trickle down. which will hopefully, yeah, the trickle down, which will hopefully lead to a more people going solar, B better environmental impact, C saving a bunch of money and D support for many more creators and publishers. So it's this like perfect ecosystem where the more successful it is, the better it is for mm. consumer brand creator. And I like these scenarios where I call it one plus one equals three. This is one plus one plus one equals yeah. five Yeah, where everybody wins and then some. And so it's like personally fulfilling, but also like really enjoyable to, 
chase these opportunities. And then my amazing team helps to actually execute on mm-hmm. like making it successful. Um, and then people are putting solar in their house or yeah. they're like finding it. That's a bit of an extenuating circumstance, but um, e- like even athletic brewing, getting into the running space, beer is not a endemic sponsor to running as much as runners love to drink. Um, but here's a company who is the number one craft brewer in America, alcohol or non-alcoholic beers, investing tons into races. Um, D- Dunkin' Donuts has been pursuing or Molly Seidel has been pursuing Dunkin' Donuts for the longest time. Kind of hard to quantify the sponsorship on um, something like that where there are a thousand Dunkin' Donuts. I think it's a thousand and four (coughs) nationwide. And for them, it's just a media buy an association with somebody that, that people love. But that's another example of like, okay, it's a bit tangential to running in that America runs on Dunkin's uh, (laughs) runners run on coffee. Um, Like I, I just, we, I think we both, are you working with long run coffee as well? I'm not, but I, I, I'm really excited by their founder. I appreciate the strategy he's laid out. And I think, I think, no, I think I truly think it's good for uh, athletes and creators like yourself, anybody involved. So long run coffee is um, uh, a coffee with electrolytes (laughs) and, they basically reached out to a handful of creators and offered to co-brand a line of coffee where the person whose brand was being leveraged received some percentage of the sale. And that's that. And you can push it however much you want. And if nobody buys, you don't get any money. And if people buy, the brand gets money and you get money. (laughs) And so it's just like, it's this interesting platform where, um, again, you don't need coffee to run. It's not a shoe. It's not a, a sports bra. It's not a watch. You don't need a watch to run either. Um, but it definitely helps yeah. with a watch and the coffee. <laughs> and, and by the way, just for, just for anybody that is out there and they're confused because we're throwing around the terms endemic and non-endemic, as John's already explained, endemic is like, any brands that are native to the space, they belong very neatly in the space. So like your running shoe brands, your watches, your, your gear companies, and then non-endemic is uh, any brands that you wouldn't naturally think are involved in running, but um, they do ultimately fit in some capacity. So like it could be like a mattress company, or as you mentioned, a solar company. Um, but it takes some pushing and prodding and case studies to show that there's ROI if they invest. Totally. And there are so many mattress companies getting into the space as well. And then, and then there are pillow companies. There's a company called uh, Lagoon Sleep, and their founder is friends with Corey McGee's boyfriend. Um, and that was their entry point into running. <laughs> and, and so I chatted with them a while back. They sent me some pillows, and they're great. And they're like, their whole premise was you spend so much time and money thinking about your bed and your bed frame Mm. and you're then you buy like a ten dollar pillow from walmart but your face goes on your pillow and your neck lies on your pillow why would you not think about like the last mile um and so they've popped up and now they're partnering with and sponsoring athletes and so whereas Previously, those athletes, and they're sponsoring a lot of collegiate athletes, which is super cool because most collegiate athletes are poor. Um, and I'm just referring to my own experience. Anyway, um, th- but th- then those are people that previously were, were reliant on performance-based contracts and forced racing and the need to perform otherwise they can't eat kind of a deal or say yes to partnerships that you know that that they don't believe wholeheartedly in and now they they're starting to have this plethora of options to choose from and it's truly like a like a gear check of like what do you what's present in your life that you just want to share with other people and for for people with a platform it's the ability to then work with that company and open open the aperture and open it up to to seeing 
if you can be a partner of theirs and, and help them achieve, you know, when it comes down to a brass tax of conversion and awareness and association. All right. We're actually resuming this conversation after a totally unintended 24 hour break. That's my fault. Uh, but picking up where we left off, Jonathan was just talking about the importance of bringing non endemic brands into the world of podcasting and athletics and event sponsorship as it pertains to the running world. And he had just gone into detail about his own experience working with freedom solar and, um, a John, it's great to have you back on the podcast and B I think the next, uh, direction I want to take this whole theme of endemic versus non endemic to is, uh, just like generally who is this helping and, uh, and why does it help our sport? Well, Finn, thanks for having me back on the podcast. It's been so long since we last caught, caught up. <laughs> um, who is this helping? Uh, this is helping everyone, right? Um, I, I, I've been running a lot with Care Goucher here in Boulder and every run flies by and, um, is over immediately because we just chat the whole time. And so coincidentally today we were talking about media and sponsorship and, um, non-endemic sponsors and um she was she was talking about how when she signed her first contract how different the world is was compared to how things are now where it was all about performance and if you weren't performing you were cut and that was that and today it's so much more around storytelling and it's so much more around the whole the whole athlete. So who is this helping both the non-endemic sponsors coming into the space and the shift in um, desired outcomes from brands? Well, it's helping everyone who isn't at the top of the podium all the time. And that's, that's that <laughs> like yeah. the, the only people who stand to gain from, the setup that it has been previously are people who are winning all the time, who don't desire to share their story. And there's a lot of discourse and dialogue on social media about like the tides are changing. People are frustrated, whatever it is, things have changed and you can, you can wallow in the, like it used to be all about performance or you can realize that this shift to storytelling um, enables more brands to stay in the space and bring money into the space, right? Like this deal that I have with freedom solar, like I want to get them to spend a quarter million dollars in running next year. And I've brought them almost that from referrals <laughs> this year. Yeah. And so it's not a, it's not a far stretch to think that a brand like that, I mean, that for them, it's like a little bit like cheating because the ticket is so high, but their margins aren't great. So they need, they, they, it, it, it is expensive and they're not making a lot of money on each thing. There's like 18 people involved in, in every install. Anyway, what it means is <laughs> we say a rising tide lifts all ships, right? We want more money pouring into the sport because this means more opportunity. It means that, that women who get pregnant can retain contracts because they are, they are most relatable in this state. Um, it means that someone who isn't performing, but is really good at, uh, at, at telling the story of like living in the suck temporarily. And here's what I'm going to do to push through and keep showing up. And like these people aren't going to go hungry and they're not going to leave the sport because they can't afford to stay in the sport. They, they're they able to work with brands and partners, or they would be able to work with brands and partners who collectively enable them to pay their bills, right? Like not everyone's being signed by Nike, not everyone's being signed by Adidas, et cetera, but some people are. But 
what I'm getting at is that collectively athletes no longer need to rely or, or at some point in the future, it's definitely trending this way. Athletes will not need to rely solely on their shoe sponsor to pay their bills. That being said, there are some people who are getting paid from shoe sponsors and that's great for them. And they're doing the storytelling. They're doing the, the, their performance. Um, and someone at these brands has decided that they're worth six figures. <laughs> and that's incredible, right? Like the whole goal of this is one plus one equals three. A lot of brands who focus on conversion and it's really easy for those who only sell online, they're focused on if we send out $1, we need at least 25 to 50 cents coming back to us in the first 30 days. Now, it's really hard for a shoe company or a sports nutrition company who's sold in running retailers to quantify the impact of sponsorship like that. But that's when we look at like traditional awareness versus conversion. Um, well, let, let me ask, let me ask you this one, one sec. I want to ask you this because you have a sales mind. You're incredibly business savvy. You're good at this. Like you're, it, it takes someone like you to bring in a relatively novel sponsor to the space. But like, if I'm an athlete listening to this conversation between you and I, how do I, identify and uh, form relationships with these types of companies that aren't the Nikes, the Patagonias, the North Faces, where it's already a very natural conversation. Do you think that athletes, there is a way for athletes to start that or are they more reliant on people like you who take care of that first difficult conversation? And then now that they're established, it's a much easier in for them. Uh, I love this question, right? It's such an easy answer. Look at yourself. Look at what's in your refrigerator. Look at what's in your bedroom. Look at what's in your living room. Look at the brands that that you purchase or you have purchased and reach out to them and send 20 messages a month or send 10 messages or send five messages and be prepared for 90% of them to say, Hey, that's not interesting. That's interesting, but we, it's not something we do. Um, most of them probably won't even reply, but all it takes is one or two. Um, again, pillows, cherry juice, tables, uh, air purifiers, dog t- treats, um, recovery tools, notebooks, notebooks sunglasses, headphones, like, l- literally everything is up for grabs in this conversation. And I mean, <laughs> look at, look at someone like, um, Ford, <laughs> Ford is doing it. Ford is, give, is, is lending cars. Corey Waltering. Yeah. Uh, Marna Valerio, um, yeah. uh, the wind, winter is coming. Ski brands. Ross Ignall is big on, um, PR and, and this and that. Like, Literally everything is fair game is what I'm, is what I'm saying. The whole point of the last 75 minutes is every single, if you're an athlete with an audience, every single thing has the potential to help you, right? You purchased all of these things. And in theory, this company probably wants more people to purchase these things. You can help. And mm-hmm. so that's where it becomes the authentic, these are things that work in my life. And this is where relationships are best because, excuse me, because it's not a stretch. It's not being pitched by a brand with a nice price tag and trying to figure out how to make it work in your life. It's Mm -hmm. here's something I've been using for 10 years and some people are good at social. Some people can just weave in things that, um, show us how they go about their life. But at some point, like if you've, if you've engaged with your audience and been a real person to your audience and you're a professional athlete, like people just want to support you. And so simply just sharing things that are enabling support of you will work, right? Like we see, 
we see all these um, membership or subscription models popping up and uh, people do it for, I'm seeing it now just for Instagram. You can send somebody five bucks a month. Yeah. Um, Grace and Murphy is doing this now to bring her yes. up again. And, and it's just like people love people and, and yes, people work hard for their money, but if a hundred people give five bucks a month or $2 a month, that's a little more than paying for your, you know, coffee habit. That's, that's starting to help pay for your food bill. And so I guess the takeaway from, from this, this ramble is look at what is in your life that you've purchased and, and like, and would want to support and then ask for help. Mm. Ask people, people want to support good people and social media enables this to occur. I don't have any advice for people who (laughs) don't use social media or, um, or whatnot, but you know, email is was the big thing. Then it went away, and now it's the big thing. It will always be the big thing. So, uh, don't rely on social as like the the end all be all for revenue generation. If if you're an athlete listening to this, you have to you have to own your list. So, social media, you're just renting space. Instagram could go down. It could be bought by Russian bots. To, uh, Elon Musk could. I saw his forty four billion dollar purchase went through today like he could shut down the whole platform and then your you know huge audience on there is completely worthless you don't own any of that space and right. and we need to acknowledge that and yep. if the if the product is free you are the product so you don't have any control right. in that situation um but yeah it, i like how you asked that question and it it lends to like anyone can be creative anyone can can reach out to a brand and somebody on the other side, figure out what their job is and figure out what you can do to help and literally ask this. Say, hey, I'm interested in working with your brand. What can I do to help? How can I help you reach your goals? The the Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people um, principle, like what matters to people? Figure out what matters to them. In a business setting, everyone has KPIs, key performance indicators. Like, understand what someone else is tasked with doing. And if you can help them do that, they'll do anything within reason. And, and so that's, that's where, where I go with these conversations. Every time it's speaking with a brand, it's like, what are you focused on and how can I help with that? Here's what's available. Here's what I can do. You tell me the next step and let's dance. I got a comment on one thing you said a little ways back and it's about rejection. I don't know about you, but on a day-to-day basis for me running this podcast, but also even just in the sales e jobs I've had in my life, I've dealt with overwhelming amounts of rejection. And in my experience, that's a feature, not a bug. (laughs) And I think if I have a list of like a hundred potential sponsors of the pod, for example, 85 won't even respond to me. 10 will be like F you five will be like not interested. Three will be like, let's book a meeting. And of that three, like one will be like, yeah, where do I sign the contract? So maybe talk about that in your experience in that realm of like prospecting for guests and sponsors and stuff like that. Because I, I think a lot of, Athletes in our sport, for example, uh, don't appreciate that that it's okay that you're going to go through quite a struggle before you get yeses. So it's a great question, and I think a lot of people don't realize this. That so there, like, there's an entire job function which is called business development, and you're you're deemed a success if your failure rate is like. Ninety percent. Yeah. That's fantastic. It's like I have batting colleagues. average in baseball, right? Like three, totally. seven out of ten times you strike out, you're still an all star. Exactly. If you're if your batting average as a as a an athlete pitching brands is is three hundred, you're you're a hero. <laughs> I want to meet you and, and shake your yeah. hand and take you to dinner. Um, the reality is, it takes a lot of time and things that you can do to maximize efficiency 
will help. So you should have a pitch deck. You should have a, or even just a one pager of like who you are, what you care about and some stats um, and what you focus on. And then like a single paragraph pre written per type of brand, right? If you're, if you're reaching out to a bunch of shoe companies, you're going to say similar things. If you're reaching out to a bunch of mattress companies, you're going to say similar things, but different than the shoe companies. Um, so anything you can do to, to maximize efficiency so that you're not doing the work a hundred times, you're doing the work five times and then adjusting and personalizing for an individual brand. Use a name, use a brand, some feature of the, of the product that you like, but it has to be actually personalized. It can't just be like, I'm interested in your shoe brand. Yeah. Um, but, but the failure piece is huge, right? Like, it, but, but look at racing, right? Athletes should be familiar with failure. Yeah. And, and I've run seven marathons and I've like not done well in five of them. And that's, that's a pretty decent <laughs> clip. Um, it's the same thing with, with pitching brands. I have a, like a list of 60 right now and I've heard back from a small percentage of them. And these are people that I know, <laughs> let alone cold, cold outreach. Yeah. So the other piece is work your network. If you know someone at a brand, that's obviously the best, the best step. But, um, Look at the brand. Look at who they're following. See if you know any of those people. Check them out on LinkedIn. See if you know anyone that works for them or if you're second connections or third connections. And if you can connect with somebody who can connect you and be like, hey, I've got this creative idea or, hey, I want to try something you might never have done before. You're much more likely to get a yes or get get to yes or get a meeting that gets you to yes. Yep. Uh, then just a cold outreach. Like I reached, I reached out to, um, 10, um, here's a trick. I reached out to, to 10 like camper trailer companies a month ago because I went camping and I wanted to go camping more, but I wanted to like pull my tent instead of <laughs> set it up. And so, I started finding brands on Instagram and then I started getting ads for brands I'd never heard of. So and then cool. I pitched, then I pitched them and I, I got a reply and one of them was like, yeah, we're actually just launching and you know, we'd trade you some demo days um, for feedback and content. And this is a $65,000 trailer. So I'm not buying that. Um, and I don't need it for more than a couple of days a season. And so here is an approach to fulfilling. It's definitely not a need, but a desire and removing a payment going both ways. They're not going to pay me. I'm not going to pay them for something that I want that maybe I'd pay for, but I really don't, I really don't want to pay for it. And I want to find a partnership that I can share them their you know product or or offering and everybody wins in this scenario so again like you can just find a bunch of these and then let let the algorithm be your friend and if it's like a roof rack you'll find 10 more brands if it's a pair of skis you'll find five more brands like a, a, a mattress you'll find a hundred more brands mattresses are hot yeah. right now <laughs> Yeah. Um, so again, just like, let, let the tools work for you and you don't have to do a ton of research, but like, if you start looking at some specific category on the internet, you're going to get served ads from brands you've never heard of. What's interesting is these brands are all using paid marketing. And so they're all interested in paid marketing. So by, by default, they may be interested in ambassador or paid relationships yes. because they already value it and they're already doing it. That's a great um, point. And, and so then just help them do their job. If you see ads on Instagram, it's a proxy for yes, we're spending money on marketing. We care. Probably a lot of money on marketing. Probably a lot of money. 
I got to, I got to, I got to tell one story from my own personal experience to make this, uh, as real as you've described. I'd say back in January of this year, 2022, started reaching out to gnarly nutrition, got crickets for three months, reached out again after like three follow ups in April. And they were like, Oh, hey, sorry. Just like didn't see your email. So it wasn't even that they weren't interested. They just didn't see the email. And then when they responded, they're like, uh, you're too small. Like reach out in like three more months. And I'm like, ah, shoot. So like reached out again, said no again in June, reached out in like July and August. Like, all right, let's do it. So like what I'm trying to show there is like, first they didn't see my stuff. Then they said, it's not the right time. Then they said, they're not interested. It took eight months, but it ended up working. And I guess what I'm trying to say there is like, when someone says no, it also doesn't mean like no forever. It just means like no in that moment. And in other instances, like if they don't respond, I mean, they probably have a cluttered inbox. So I'm just trying to like yeah. give the listeners permission to just like be respectfully relentless. Totally. And there are a handful of brands where I've had that, I've had that experience and I followed up quarterly and two years later we have a deal Yeah, and it's fantastic. Um, gnarly nutrition is, it's funny. I have all these brands that I've talked to that have high levels of B12 that want to sponsor the podcast. <laughs> like I, I declined gnarly as well, but I love what they're doing and I love like the scholarships they're doing. I love their yeah. support of your podcast and free trail and, and so many cool athletes. Ashley Winchester, um, is another one that, that they support. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, even, yeah, with, with, with so many brands, it's like, I'm doing the same thing with Strava right now where, um, it, it was a not right now. It was a no, then it was a not right now. And then it's a, let's have a discussion. Yeah. <laughs> and that's over a nine month period. And so unless the person says like, absolutely not, never contact me again and delete your, delete my email. It's, it's total permission to, yeah. if, if there's a legitimate fit and opportunity and you're in the right ballpark, there's no reason. Don't do it every week. Don't do it every month, but quarterly, like it's fine to check in. But the other piece is managing expectations, right? You can literally ask, is it okay for me to check in in three months to see if this is, a, if the, if it's a better time? Yeah. So much in, in, s- so much of success is based on managing expectations and you've, if that person says yes, you better follow up in three months because they're saying, please ask, please send me an email in three months. If they say no, focus your efforts elsewhere. And, and so I love, I love getting to know. I like getting to yes more, but I like getting to know because it tells me stop focusing on this, stop getting excited about this and focus elsewhere. So binary answers are your friend. Unfortunately, the majority of answers are maybe or yeah. not right now or just no response, period. By the way, if you, the listener, are 90 minutes into this pod, A, we salute you and B, uh, you're probably invested in this conversation. So I'll tell you what I'll send. I know that I'll send you my deck. If you're, if you're an athlete or you're a creator and you're looking for a way to get started, I'll send you my deck and I can commit to three to five conversations off the record with you guys about uh, my own experience. And maybe it can help you in some capacity. Cause I don't know. I feel like part of the aim for what we're doing here, right. Is uh, just helping people get educated and helping them create opportunities to, uh, to carve out some space and some living in the sport. Right. I'll double that. I'll I'll make the same offer. First three to five people I'm happy to have that conversation with. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Right on. Um, maybe we pivot to like just the general importance of supporting creators. I know you have strong feelings on this. So uh, <laughs> maybe talk about why it's important. And I think it's also important to contrast why you believe in it with what the alternatives are, which you think might be <laughs> inferior. Did you share publicly that you put in your two weeks notice? Uh, it's on this pod. Yeah. So I, I actually <laughs> did it today. We're recording the, the second part. Hell of yeah. We're recording it today. I, I just put my two weeks notice in today. So here we're sitting, listening to the single track podcast run single track from Finn. 
Finn has bet on himself here, and you, the listener, are benefiting from it. There are brands, I believe, Gnarly, Athletic Greens, and Inside Tracker that are currently sponsoring his podcast and are enabling him to do what he's doing and put more effort into it. They review the numbers of conversions, of reach, and they look at these metrics and this um, enables them to continue sending him checks that allow him to now do this full time, Mm. right? Not every podcaster does it full time, um, but many do or many aspire to and many don't aspire to. Like I love my job and I love podcasting and I love them both together. But I'm also like I have four people under me. I need <laughs> I need to get paid to 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 pay them. Um, so the the brand relationship is essential for a lot of podcasters. And so when you use discount codes, when you subscribe, when you follow the brand, when you fill out email giveaways, you're telling Finn or whoever the podcaster is that. You you want to support and you want to it's a vote. help. Yeah. yeah, it's a vote. Yeah, it's a vote. Um, so again, there are plenty of ways to 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 vote without spending money. Again, rate, v- review, subscribe. This is yeah. incredibly huge, important. Huge, by the way. And the other way to do it is vote with your dollars. And most podcasters are sharing brands that they work with, that they love, that they use, that trust them. And there's that that two-way trust where the brand is trusting them to share their message and the podcaster is trusting them to help enable it to actually occur, right? So when you use that discount code of single track or FTLR or whatever the code is, um, someone's looking at that. And, and by having that that our uh, return on investment substantial enough it's a way to allow that relationship to continue so personally tracksmith has been a supporter of mine since um i don't know april of 2021 awesome brand by the way summer of 2021 which is crazy right um they they've they've enabled so much to happen over that period and people are using the code, right? Like thousands of dollars have funneled, t- tens of thousands of dollars have funneled through that code, um, which they've also paired with a 5% donation to a charity that I select. So right now, like uh, Bigger Than The Trail gets 5% of all, of all um, purchases through the Tracksmith website with my code. I, I don't want to be like... <laughs> anyway... So they, they do these different things that, that incentivize people to use the code, whether it's a discount, whether it's an incentive to, to get a donation to go somewhere. It's all about attribution and understanding um, where sales are coming from. So what I was saying before is some brands are, are simply interested in awareness and they want to partner with big podcasts and have a lot of people learn about their brand. Other brands that potentially are just sold through um, the internet have a really interesting and useful ability to track attribution. So they they can know that you know X percent of their sales come from podcasters, and they know that Finn's podcast contributes X dollars per month. Um, and so the way that this is evaluated is on an ROI basis return on investment so in an ideal scenario you know you're spending a dollar you're making more than a dollar maybe three dollars a three to one ratio is fantastic Mm. for for one as mark um uh kevin from shark tank says my little one dollar bill is going out to fight in the world and comes back with two more dollars (laughs) (laughs) Um, i love that so some brands are satisfied with uh, 0.25 to 0.5 X return on investment. So they spend a dollar, they get 25 cents or 50 cents back. 
Some brands, it must be a dollar. Some brands, it must be $3. What's often not accounted for in that initial, let's say, 30 to 60 day period is what's called the lifetime value of a customer. So if you buy a mattress, the lifetime value of a customer is probably one mattress, whatever the cost of that one mattress is, maybe a second one. So not not very strong. So they rely on referral programs and whatnot, or just acquiring lots and lots and lots of new customers. It's always easier to retain a customer than it is to get a new customer. So brands with a consumable product or something that's seasonal, like apparel or supplements or food, you can look at like, okay, the value of bringing in $1 is actually $4 or $5. So it's not always about the one-to-one. It's like, okay, what is the value of this new customer? And so now we're like getting a little deeper than I think we were intending to, but um, this is where I spend a lot of my time uh, at my day job, but also um, as a podcaster and person who's doing it on their own as well. I'll say a couple things um, because I just had a really interesting cat on the podcast recently, Jack Kenzel, and he said an FKT on the Bob Graham round took down a Killian Jornet record, but he's got a lot of interesting thoughts on the intersection of sponsorship and athletes. And I I told him, and we we talk offline about this a lot because we we take probably opposite views. And uh, I think generally he takes issue with the mixing of, of business into running and the increasing professionalization of the sport and all the outlets around it. And I think he probably prefers this to to be a hobby and to let other areas of his life uh, provide the support for it. But um, I don't know the way I see it. Like there life is all about trade-offs and how much, how much time on a weekly basis goes into, for example, the training you do or the podcast production and, how do you balance that with social and family and recreation and sleep and other work and other responsibilities? Uh, I think when people are trying to make money around their running or to make money around their podcasting, I don't think that the first, uh, what do you put it? Like the first interpretation should be, Oh, they're, they're selling out or, Oh, you know, this is just like a money grab. It's, when I think about it, and maybe it's just because I, I have experience now and I've, I've gotten to talk to people like you and a lot of athletes and race directors, my first interpretation is, oh, these people are taking the necessary steps to invest more time, energy, and focus into our world so that their work is better, the content's better, their impact is bigger, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm wondering how you feel about that. Yeah, 100%. It's all about how you allocate time, right? Like I could spend a lot more time doing my yard work (laughs) or I could take the money that I'm earning and pay someone to do that and focus on what makes me happy and, and focus on like investing more time and effort into the podcast. It's the reason why I've, I've assembled a team under me. Time is your most valuable asset. And it's the, if you ask wealthy people, they'll tell you that you don't even have to ask wealthy people. It's the thing that you can't get more of, right? You can have all the money in the world, but you cannot add more time to the day. Yeah. And I've seen a bunch of tweets and conversations with people like Joe Holder on Twitter, where the dialogue is all about financial freedom is freedom of your schedule and being in control of your calendar. And that's what I think a lot of people aspire to. Yeah. And so by like having sponsors and having people that that do the things that A, you're not good at, or B, you don't find fun, that's adding freedom into your day. And you can allocate that time to do things that make you happy, right? I'm in the pursuit of doing things that make me happy. Yeah. And avoiding things that that don't um and that's not always possible like life exists other people are important and like you can't just be a, a selfish being but if you can do things that that remove 
stuff from your plate that it doesn't you don't need to be doing again because you're not good at it or because it doesn't make you happy but still needs to get done that's where that's where like the the ability to have somebody else help you is is important i think i want to go back to um you were starting to talk about this sh- or we were talking about the shift in um sponsorship and and performance versus storytelling yeah i feel like a lot of people may have been listening and been thinking like man he's missing one key aspect of the shift in sponsorship yeah it's association like p- brands aligning with good people and people who are doing good things and you cannot quantify that there's there's value in thought leadership there's value in supporting good people and and again enabling them to do what what they love and what makes them happy and what and helps them bring more life into the world mm-hmm. and so there's there's that i think there's a lot of that happening um with with we're well, going to have some dog barking here again um, there's a lot of that happening as well. Uh, and I, and I don't want, I didn't want us to miss that aspect. Oh no, no, that's huge. That's huge. Let me actually, uh, let, let's go back to that in one second. Cause I want to say one more thing on the previous topic and for like the Jack Kenzels of the world and anybody that does take issue with uh, the increasing amount of money in our sport. I still think there's a good debate there. I agree. Even though I take the opposite view, I think one important thing to talk about is, the source of the money. So uh, we as podcasters, we as athletes, we as event directors, race creators, et cetera, are we pushing products that uh, we believe in that we think people need and want, or is it stuff that's wasteful? Are we driven by just the bottom line? And are we, are we making sacrifices from like a moral and ethical standpoint? I do see the point they have there. And uh, I know you've taken a pretty firm stance on this saying that, you know, any product that shows up on, for the long run, it's it's something you've tested. It's something that works for you. It's something you believe in. Um, I would say the same about uh, what I've pushed on my show, and um, but I think that that's a really like that's a fair point that they bring to the table. Yeah, totally. And you can't trust everyone, right? And so I think that's why like cultivating a strong audience and an audience that respects you is and trusts you right trust is the most important aspect of this and once you burn the trust you've lost and there you you can't really get it back um and so in the last 18 months i've had to be incredibly particular with um, what i share and what i push harder than other stuff and Mm. i don't think social media is a place for exclusively promoting things. Des Linden posted the other day, like make Instagram, Instagram again, here's my lunch. (laughs) And like, (laughs) that's, and so like I post like ugly dinner photos Um, that that's, that's all important too. Uh, But yeah, to your point, there is no, you know, regulatory board of ethics when it comes to podcasting and it is, or creator or event director or whatever. And it's, it's the wild west and there's, um, like Karen and I were talking this morning about, uh, a brand that came on strong in the endurance space, started sponsoring a bunch of athletes and it was a supplement that didn't have an NSF approval and nobody's had any problems. They have plenty of, you know, regulatory or, or, um, internal testing and batch testing, et cetera. But she was like, for me, my moral compass and everything I stand for says I must protect clean sport coming from her where like she's, she's been robbed of opportunity from not clean sport. Mm. That was a, a threshold she was not willing to cross. And mm. so everyone has their, um, has their line. And that for her, that was the line that she would not cross. And she was like, yeah, the paycheck would have been nice, but I can't do it. And I think all of us have, at least in some capacity, like a moral compass or hopefully, and, and that's what drives us. But then there are people out there that, you know, they're the, every December or January is such an interesting time because you see 
these shifts in shoe sponsors and you see athletes that are like, Oh man, I love, you know, I'm so excited to represent X, Y, Z new brand because they're, carbon plates better than everyone else's and their recovery shoe is the best and my easy runs have gotten so much better and like i can't stand that period i understand why it exists and i understand why these these posts happen but every every time i see it i'm like man how has nobody called bullshit on this (laughs) Mm. i know (sighs) i want to come back to what we were talking about in the changing athlete sponsor relationship. Um, and I'll, I'll make a pretty strong statement. Nothing or very few things in the running world, uh, make me more mad than when an athlete laments that everything is changing and that they're not being directly rewarded for social media or for performance anymore. And that they have to be active on social media and that for right or wrong. I don't know where it comes from, but they have this idea that, uh, if they start working with a brand, they have to like put out these cookie cutter posts that aren't themselves and that just by virtue of the changing nature of the relationship, um, they have to be this like content robot. And I think we should try to dispel that here because um, at least the contracts that I've had a chance to look at and in, in the conversations I've had, um, athletes have a pretty, a lot of creative freedom to, to portray themselves on social media and to work with these brands. Um, so I'm curious what you think there and why you think it's maybe a good thing. Yeah, it's fun. That's a, that's a good question. Um, there's, uh, so speaking from personal experience, I've worked with agents and brands and athletes. So again, we're on both sides of the coin here. Um, who have outlined very specific deliverables and it didn't work. And once the reins were pulled back and a little creative freedom, creative liberty was given, it the partnership thrived. Hmm. Um, I think there's a lot to... I did a podcast with a guy named Phil Gaiman. He's a uh, ex professional cyclist who's doing better today from a from a monetary perspective than he ever was as a professional cyclist. He said he was getting paid two thousand dollars a year by Jelly Belly, not two thousand dollars a month, two thousand dollars a year. And now I've signed contracts with him that are <laughs> similar sized. And um, yeah, to use him as an example. We worked with him and had very specific requests and it didn't work. And he said, look, man, I've been doing this for a long time. I know my audience. Don't let, don't let me be this cookie cutter person because it's not going to work and we're not going to, this is not going to be a long-term relationship. We said, fine, pull back on the um, approach and he does his thing and it works. And so I think it's all about the in, the in the individual. So some people need handholding and they need curation by an expert and other people know exactly what they're doing and they know exactly what to, um, they know exactly how to speak to their audience. I, yeah. I take a middle of the road approach where like my relationship with Prevenex, they know how to speak to their customers. They're a, a supplement brand um, and born out of the CEO's background of clinical research and basically understanding how the supplement industry worked yeah. and using his knowledge to put out better supplements and focus on quality. So he knows what resonates with his customers and I know what resonates with my audience and we blend to get, we blend that together Mm. and the message is evidence-based and personalized. Yeah. Something like Tracksmith, they tell me the clothes they want to focus on and I apply my knowledge of how the seasons work (laughs) and how sweating happens and, and, you know, Taylor pun intended the um the discussion about the apparel to to that 
And then there are people that are just like, tell me what to do. And their audience is used to that and it works. And then there are people like Phil, like plenty of other people who are experts. They've been in this for a long, long enough time that if somebody tells them what to do, they're going to push back and they're going to say, I, I need, I need the creative Liberty. Otherwise this isn't going to work. So again, if you're an athlete listening to this, be open and honest with the brand, talk to them about your style and ask them how is best, how it's best to work together. Do you have specific messaging that you need to get across or is it more about association and experiential? Now, most brands will have like brand guidelines or things that like you can't ever say or like claims that can't be made or like the, the brand is one word and like, please don't put a space in between. But outside of that, like do your thing, talk about it however you want. And my favorite athlete to work with is the athlete that you show the end zone or the finish line to use a running analogy and they figure out the route to get there. Those are the people that um, honestly do best because it's less management of the athlete or creator and more goal oriented. And the process is up to them to figure out, mm. which is fun. I agree. Uh, and by the way, correct me if I'm wrong here when I say this, but my understanding is that at least in the context of running sponsorships, the re one of the major reasons why performances translated into sponsorship until very recently is because marketers and brands and anybody that was investing money into the sport lacked the tools of social media and measurement that we have now in order to focus on things that we couldn't measure in the past, like storytelling and the audiences that you build via Instagram and Twitter and email. And that's part of why the shift has been enabled. And it's more of like a meritocracy where you don't have to win a race to be successful. You can be someone that's outspoken and has good messages to share. And to me, that makes sense because, and I'll, and I'll say this and it's kind of crass, but like, how does you winning a race on its own, on its own, like not including other things, how does that help the brand? How does that help other people? How does that on its own resonate? There's just so many other factors. It used to, it used to be because it sold shoes. Yeah. And everyone wanted the Nikes that X, Y, Z athlete wore to win whatever race it is. And now people are, are craving connection and craving emotion in their purchasing and like they feel some loyalty and they feel uh, they feel something and it's 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 the like you'll never meet the majority of the athletes that you see on social media but you want to like be like them or you want to um this is more so how it used to be where like you wanted to um you know it's the like michael jordan in the you know, jumping like you want to be like like Mike. Mike. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But now it's, now it's the, well, I want to be like Keely who, you know, had a tough injury and has grown a ton and I want to grow a ton. And, and she hasn't done it again yet, but she's going to, and I, I want to be there with her or support the brands that support her. And, use the ultra running shoes and, you know, goo or scr- whatever it is. Um, and they, f- the people are truly fans of, so similar to how like you wear a Boston Red Sox hat, you're, you're, there's like a, there's like pride. Um, ever since moving to Boulder, like scratch is the fuel that people in Boulder use scratch and spring. And it's like a it's it's like a cult following because it's like it's a local brand and people love it and like I've been in their office a handful of times and like I really just want to support those people because they're awesome and they're they're doing it for the right reasons and so there's some sense of like pride 
in tagging them on Instagram or, um, you know, seeing the kit with the super fuel or like whatever it is. And people are craving this connection. And so like the, the association with the brand is, or the association with the athlete is like the, the bridge to the brand. And so to go back to your, to go back to your question, which let me I'm say one thing about Keely. Let me say one thing about Keely because I think this is a great example. Uh, she has a partnership with your company Inside Tracker, and the way she publishes those Instagram posts that mention your brand and her use of the products, uh, I think is is a great example here. She's incredibly generous with her audience about why she uses the product, how she uses the product, and then how she applies all of the takeaways from the results of like the lab test, for example, to her own training. And when you read it, you don't feel like she's sold out. You don't feel like this is all forced upon her. You feel truly like uh, this is an essential part of her daily training regimen and how she improves as an athlete. Incredibly authentic and incredibly generous. Like you feel like you've picked up learnings for your own uh, stuff along the way. And that's the goal. And so fun story about Keely. Um, she purchased Inside Tracker on her own in 2015 um, with like a Black Friday discount, and and then was connected to us again by our relationship with Goo, and so Goo sponsored their pro athletes to use Inside Tracker for like three years. Actually, they're still doing it. So this that was oh my god, <laughs> seven years ago. <laughs> Holy crap. Um, I said three. Wow, that was seven years ago. Um, and at the time, Keely was working at Nike, and she had a full time job, and also, uh, you know, a small contract with Nike. And over the years, she had been telling me about her desire to quit her job and be a full time athlete and go back to school. And so, as we grew, I said, "We will support you financially." When we can. And in the meantime, thank you for sharing the way you're sharing. This is amazing. We'll continue to support you with product, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we had a conversation a, a couple of years ago at this point, and she was like, I, I think I'm going to do it. Can we like, can we work together formally on this? So we sponsored her podcast and we have a, a um, like an individual ambassador paid partnership with her mm. and that plus her other partnerships allowed her to quit her job yeah and so and cool. so i'm i'm so proud of that experience um i've been at inside tracker since 2014 and uh, it took a lot to get where we are today and i always gave my word that when we could pay people we would pay the ones first who helped us get to where we were so for a handful of years, it was like in-kind trade with athletes who truly believed in the mission and felt value and, and an association with the brand and a, 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 with the mission of the brand, which is do what you love for longer. So for an athlete, they're, they're using the platform because it's something that's critical to their health and performance and longevity in the sport, which allows them to pay their bills. And for me, it was like so validating and, and fulfilling that we kept up on our end of the bargain and we sponsored dozens of athletes now in a paid capacity. Yeah. And so one of the things that made me the most proud of my entire career was last Black Friday where say what you will about Black Friday, but, um, discount codes galore. Right. <laughs> but what was so cool about what we were able to do was we asked people to share a story about something related to Inside Tracker. So you may have seen a hundred different posts, but every single one was different. And mm -hmm. every single one told a story. And our and what happened was people probably saw 10 different posts, between 10 and, I don't know, 40 different posts, and related to a couple of them. They saw themselves in Keeley, who was under fueling and had super low iron. They, they saw themselves in Shalane who had, you know, high cholesterol as someone who's like conventionally 
looks healthy, right? Yeah. Um, and had work to do. And so they're like, if they, if these athletes who are at the top of the, the, their sport are experiencing this, well, maybe I am too. And maybe I can improve. And so it's like bringing these people who are so elite. I don't want to say down to earth, but like to make them relatable through storytelling and through like a deeply personal, like sharing, I have low testosterone or yeah. these types of things. Yeah. And again, I was so proud just like scrolling through Instagram and, and seeing all that stuff. And so that's the epitome of everything we've been talking about where yep. it's linking a feeling, an emotion, uh, a relatability to someone that you respect and trust and learning from a brand and then to bring it full circle, maybe purchasing and, and showing, um, showing that it all works. And, and I'm so fortunate that like a conversion for us is it like tangibly means we're going to help somebody with their health, right? It's not like selling another, uh, box or piece of wood or like, uh, light bulb. It's like functionally going to help and improve your life. And so for me, it's so exciting that like, that's what the outcome is. And it's also how I try and align with brands where like freedom solar, um, it's all about environmentalism and saving money and feeling good about, you know, your, your consumption with Prevenex, it's creating health with Tracksmith. It's like feeling good. It's not chafing. It's like, looking awesome when you're doing it um, with, you know, with Gooder, it's, you know, these glasses, I can't believe that every single person in Boulder wears Gooders. It's like, and that's tribal, right? I feel a part of something because of that. I declined Gooder four times <laughs> and they kept coming back. And, and funny story on that one was my friends were making, I was wearing these Oakleys and um, they're just like super intense, and I was like wearing them to bar, like, um, like a like a beer garden. And my college friends were making fun of me every single time they saw a post about it. And it just so happens that one of the days that Gooder reached out was a day that I posted a photo in these Oakleys, which were like bright orange. And my college friends like tore me a new one. <laughs> I was like, okay, fine, yes. And they've been sponsoring the podcast since March of 2021 as well. And and. Then here I am in Boulder and every single person wears them. And it's just like this association or thing that connects people as silly as it sounds like try and tell me you don't feel like something when you pass someone on the street and there's something similar about the two of you, whether it's an article of clothing, whether it's the shoes you're wearing, like you, everyone craves connection and brands are brands are creating that i interrupted you earlier when i mentioned the keely story do you remember what you were going to say i have no idea <laughs> <laughs> i apologize for that but hey shout out to keely I, like i said i i truly believe it if, if there's if there's a aspiring pro athlete or a pro athlete that's listening and you're looking for a great case study in someone who is doing sponsored posts. Well, I, anytime I read Keely's content, I feel like, uh, well, I know it's, it's just genuine and it's helpful and it's generous. So, well, it's incredibly intentional, right? I had yeah. this conversation with her. I don't know. I had a black Friday, 2018. She's like, I'll never work with more than a handful of brands and I'll never work with brands that I don't love the people, the mission and the products. And I think that if everyone could, I don't know, abide by that little trio of, of, um, check boxes, uh, we'd phase out all the crap and the good stuff would, would rise to the top and, and people would be supported and, uh, appreciated and, and whatnot. But again, to, to give Keely more kudos, um, what an incredible athlete, storyteller, uh, science communicator uh, mm -hmm. and podcast host. Yep. Have we gone two hours? This is crazy. Yeah, we're at two hours. I think we're over. Well, I think we passed two hours about 15 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think here. Well, I'm looking at my notes. We've 
we've covered a lot of good ground. Uh, a couple more things I want to ask you besides the non endemic stuff and maybe just the changing expectations from potential sponsors for shows like ours. Do you see anything else as part of the next evolution in the running media space coming down? Yeah, everything is, everything is content and storytelling and leveraging user generated content, leveraging stories, leveraging. Um, I was listening to uh, Peter Abraham on uh, the free trail podcast. Yeah, good episode. And they were talking about this as well. And like, we just published a, um, or we're going to publish a, a hood to coast um, video. This is a 20 minute video with Joe Holder and a team that he ran hood to coast with. <laughs> and I texted my coworker. I was like, man, this is so captivating. And the brand is a striker brand. Didn't have a huge role in the, in the piece, but it's part of the relationship. It's part of the, um, the, the whole story and what connects us to these people. Um, Dylan and uh, a handful of other people are, are basically curating these mini documentaries with athletes. They did what he did one with Tim Tolson yep. up to Western States and this kind of stuff. I think this is the future. I think it's like a brand outsourcing media creation and content creation to some sort not an agency but like a video guy or a um, photographer like we've done a lot of work with um, Courtney White uh, through Bowerman Track Club and Shalane Flanagan and Courtney's team is so fantastic at like captivating and like getting the the true um, story and it's because of the trust between the videographer and like and talent is a crude way to put it, but talent, uh, Shalane. Um, and when we first started publishing this stuff, people who are like pretty veteran in the space were like, man, I saw a side of, of her that I'd never seen before. And it was cause she was playing with her baby Jack and like being a human who just so happened to be an Olympian and New York city marathon winner and blah, blah, blah. But that's the thing, like we are craving these like inside looks at what makes someone tick and the brands that can tie that back to their fundamental mission, they're going to win. Yep. And, and just like consuming or, or watching these videos and understanding how to link like a captivating video back to the brand mission that's the future. One other thing, again, I was talking about this with Kara this morning that we, we see shifting is um, broadcasting. And so look at Western States, look at UTMB, look at what Sidious is doing with track and field. Sidious had like a recovery zone sponsored by UFOS at the at Eugene the, at the World Championships, and so they would literally pull people off the track, sit them down, probably in a hyper ice chair, yeah, um, and put UFOs on them. Brilliant, <laughs> and Brilliant. and talk about and talk about their race, sort of like you know a Monday morning armchair quarterbacking, um, and this is so captivating. And we need to figure out ways to do more of this. And so Kara was thinking, like, how do I get NBC to do it? Or how do I get somebody to do it for marathoning or track and field or whatnot? Um, but but look at what what Western States is doing with 30 hours of coverage. Look at UTMB with, like, if UTMB can do it, 107 miles around Mont Blanc <laughs> in the middle of the Alps, we can do this at tracks. We can do this at you know, major road marathons. We can do this anywhere. Um, if, if you can, if you can run along Killian and Jim, uh, and Courtney and like get up in their face with a camera and that's fine, apparently. Um, and, and like watch how things unfold and then talk about it and then tie in sponsors who 
are funding the ability to do this kind of stuff, but like making, making it so core to what they're doing. The, the, the UFOs thing was brilliant where, Hey, put on the recovery slides. <laughs> it's so smart, but it's, it's also so simple. Um, Oh, it's sunny out here. Put on these, but like, that's the future. The future is like truly emerged, um, emerged anyway, like really in it and, and so core to the, the offering of that brand. That's the association that, that makes sense. That's the association that allows brands to invest behind it. And that's what allows creators and athletes and broadcasts to, to exist. I want to reinforce what you said there about brands outsourcing media and storytelling creation to these companies like free trail. I think I couldn't agree more. I think it's part of the future and my mind starts to spin for all the people that are out there with those skills, with those video skills, with those writing skills, with those podcasting skills who, uh, who can recognize a story in their community, recognize maybe the formation of, a group or a community and say, Hey, there's something here and pitching it to a brand and not just doing it for like their own career's sake, but knowing that they're going to create something that's probably pretty evergreen and it's going to have a huge impact on uh, just distribution of the sport beyond hardcore fans. Totally. And then there are so many people doing such a good job of it. Uh, my buddy, Tony De Pasquale has been doing I just it with, met him, by the with way. Hoka. He's incredible, right? Yeah. So I know I him from like 20, Tony with a Sony. Um, I, we ran rim to rim to rim together and he ran n- south to north with the Sony and uh, he, he ditched it with our friends at the North Rim. He, he's doing it. He's working with a lot of people in the Bay Area. Um, Kenny Withrow um, out here in Boulder is uh, Miranda Carfrey. Can I and, say one thing uh, about Tony? So yeah, he, I please. met him out. I met him out in Chamonix. <sighs> for UTMB and he was on a contract with rabbit and he was filming my friend, Jimmy Elam, uh, who was racing UTMB. And I remember the very next day, Tony publishes this reel. It's for lack of a better phrase, fucking sick. It was awesome. Like he (laughs) crushed it. And I remember, uh, Jimmy's other sponsor ultra, uh, one of their reps was there and he looks over Tony's shoulder and he's like, is there any way we can get our hands on that? Like a copy of that. So like, right. Like just amazing. Like, uh, that's a great example of like spontaneous serendipitous business development and how like if you build it, all of these other people will become interested and they'll come. And he's a super talented creator, but that was one of the lasting memories I have from Shaman. He's like, this guy like kind of self-funded his trip over there and he was chasing Jimmy around the mountain and getting these impossible shots at like four in the morning as the sunrise was happening or in Triant and and he he does what he's supposed to do for rabbit. But then there's like three more brands that are like, what you just did is sick. And like, we're on board. Like, how do we get what you're creating? Yeah, totally. Um, I love that. I mean, talk about people who have taken a leap. Tony was a software developer, you know, um, making the big bucks. And now he is doing photo and video for outdoor and adventure brands making significantly less than he was, but is super happy. Um, And that's what I think we should all aspire to be, right? Like chase what makes you happy and do more of that. And like he bet on himself and it's working and it's really cool to see. And he's a good friend of mine. So it's (laughs) it's really cool to hear that story and be able to talk about him. I'm going to have to tell him he's going to have to listen to two and a half hours of uh, <laughs> this podcast to, to hear the shout out. But um, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. That's what I'm talking about. Awesome and, and then, though. and then supporting people like him by investing in the storytelling and brands need people like him to create the storytelling. So it's this like perfect symbiotic relationship where again, one plus one equals three. That's what we should all be chasing. How do we all win? How do we all make each other better? How do we all help everyone else by helping each other? Because we all win. Rising tide lifts all ships. Mm. There's this great quote in the tech world, build once, sell twice. It's all about uh, like the marginal costs of 
software development stuff, but it applies to efficiency. content too. It's efficiency, yeah. yeah. And so copy one, paste. Exactly. <laughs> um, all right, maybe we we start to close up here with a couple final future focused questions as it pertains to your podcast for the long run and your involvement in the media side of our sport. Uh, what's next for you? And maybe we, to narrow that down, it's like in the next year or so, what are some projects or conversations or just anything with the pod that particularly excites you? I sent, um, so my, um, I don't know what to call her, uh, like saving grace or um, hero or whatever, but uh, Emily, who who helps with the podcast, was just, um, <laughs> helps is doing a lot of work in that. <laughs> <laughs> that sentence um she's managing me at this point um she was just climbing kilimanjaro and she got back a couple days ago and i sent her some notes and in the notes i said youtube a few other things youtube a few other things and youtube <laughs> um so she's like oh you want to talk about youtube huh uh so the goal is to get on youtube i hate being on video i hate like recording myself um, but I understand how, uh, you, again, we talked about it. YouTube is the second largest search engine yeah, it's and it's how things are growing. So I want to get on YouTube. Um, I want to continue to invest behind the podcast and in the team. I don't even want to do more. I just want like more doers on the team. Uh, I'd be remiss to not mention Ruby Wiles, who is um, a collegiate athlete who helps with the show notes and pulling quotes and so and and guest management and so many other things. Um, Brian Walters, who is of single track sound, so this is uh, eventually he'll get the run single track audio. Um, he is the audio engineer. He produced the the intro uh, music to the podcast. Um, so I'm so grateful for him. And then Tony with a Sony built my website. Awesome. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> And uh, we've shared a ton of miles together. So I want to keep investing, and Emily Holland, I want to keep investing in these people. I want to keep, uh, uh, and Angie Marie is on the social team. Um, it's like so crazy I can talk about <laughs> like this of this many people. Um, I want her to do more. Uh, I, I want to just build. I'm, I, I don't have goals. I just, I'm just curious. Uh, I want to see how far I can go. I want to see how many millions of downloads we can get. I want to see, uh, I want a 500% ROI and then grow that partnership. Uh, if I saw 500% ROI, that's <laughs> undervaluing. But anyway, um, we're somewhere close there with Freedom Solar. But um, anyway, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. I want to keep growing it. I want to see where it can go. But I want to just have awesome conversations with really interesting people and help people learn about how to be better and how to live better and how to um, navigate the times that aren't so awesome. Uh, and I feel I'm, I'm doing that. So I just want to do more of it. I know that, oh, oh, sorry, I should say with the caveat that you are extremely satisfied and fulfilled working at inside tracker. If we fast forward five or 10 years down the road, is there a possibility that you could be a full-time creator slash entrepreneur at that point? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I, I'm so invested in inside tracker from being there since the beginning effectively that like I'm, I love what I do. I'm very happy there. I'm challenged. I'm being challenged more than ever before. And I'm, I'm learning from the people above me. And as long as that's the situation, I think if you're in a place where you're satisfied but not hungry, that's a sign that it's time for a change. But if you're if you're satisfied and hungry or happy and hungry, mm. that's a good place to be. And that's where I am with both Inside Tracker and the podcast. And if I can remain happy and hungry in both of those mediums, I'm winning, right? Like, how does it get... How does it get better than that from a professional standpoint? I don't think it does. And and so I'm incredibly grateful that I'm in this position where I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm able to support others and feel like people are truly invested in me. Like I can't I can't make any changes in in that situation. 
Yeah. But it comes down to like, I'm never satisfied. I'm never truly satisfied. And that's, that's, that's a, as you said, that's a feature, not a, not a bug. Mm. That's why I believe the podcast has grown to where it is. That's why Inside Tracker has grown to where it is because status quo is my enemy and I, I hate being bored. <laughs> and so that's my North Star. Just like stay hungry, stay happy and, and support the people who make it possible. Amen. Well, I've learned a ton in this conversation. I for sure appreciate you being in the space, creating, adding to the conversation, adding to the uh, audio uh, space in our sport and more. And video soon. <laughs> and video soon. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll make sure to link to For the Long Run podcast. It's a great show in the show notes. We'll link to all your other relevant socials as well. Uh, I always give the guest free reign here at the end. Is there, are there any calls to action you have or are there any other parting thoughts you have before we sign off? Oh man, that's a loaded question. A call to action. Um, if you haven't run yet today, uh, think about why you're excited to go for a run. If you're currently running, you're on quite a long run because we've gone <laughs> two and a half hours. So kudos to you. Um, and if you've already run today, um, be grateful that you, that you can. Perfect. John, thanks again. And, uh, I'm sure this is just round one of, uh, a whole slew of future conversations. Cool. What are you doing tomorrow at 5 PM? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Finn, thank you so much. Thank you for all you do, uh, for your passion for the sport and growing the sport and also attempting to disrupt status quo. Um, it's uh, very much appreciated. I've had a ton of conversations with um, people who are high up, pro athletes, etc. Um, and they all truly and deeply respect what you're doing in this space. Uh, so keep doing it and congrats on uh, taking a, a big step today. <laughs>